This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Uh, today we have ANS fellow John Krajlovic, who is a lifelong devotee and serious student of uh, history and numismatics. Uh, due to his knowledge, experience, and integrity, he's been considered as one of America's leading professional numismatists and most in-demand experts by institutions, collect uh, collectors, and other num numismatists for over two decades now. Uh, he's been a longtime instructor of the American Numismatic Association's annual summer seminar, uh, which Lucia Carbonia and I will be at this summer as well. Um, as such, John was named as an honorary doctor of numismatics by the INA in 2015. He was awarded the Numismatist of the Year honor in 2016, and also the Glenn Smedley Award in 2011. John has cataloged some of those important collections sold over the past few decades, uh, many of which the, the catalogs have themselves have become standard reference works in those series. Uh, some of these collections include the, the Brent Pogue collection, uh, which is the most valuable collection ever sold, uh, the La Riviera collection of Betts medals, the Elisberg collection of world gold coins, uh, the Norweb collection of Washington medals, the John W. Adams collection of Comitia Americana medals, and so many more, many, many more. Uh, John was the youngest person ever elected to the membership of the Rittenhouse Society, which is an, an honorary fraternity of numismatic researchers. And uh, I believe that's the same for his status as an a a ANS fellow. You may be the youngest uh, elected that, to that position as well. Oh. Huh. John except is, for Augustus Sage, probably, you know. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but he was just kind of, yeah, uh, grandfathered in or grandfathered right. in, as the case may be. Uh, John is an annual contributor to the world famous Red Book, uh, as well as dozens of other numismatic reference books, including the 100 Greatest American Medals and Tokens and other works by Q. David Bowers, uh, the early uh, paper money of America by Eric P. Newman, and again, many, many more numismatic references. Uh, he's been tapped for his knowledge by the, by the Smithsonian, uh, the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, the Massachusetts Historical Society, Monticello, and again, many, many more. Uh, he's a native of uh, Chester County, Pennsylvania, which hits home a little to me. I have in-laws who live there. Uh, as well as a graduate of the University of Virginia and is currently a resident of Fort Mill, South Carolina, which is just outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. So, John, uh, it's my honor to please, uh, you may begin. Well, thank you and thank, thanks for the introduction and thanks to, to you all for, for joining us and spending your, your Friday lunch uh, uh, with us to, to talk about coins. Um, uh, this is my first long table. I'm a little embarrassed to admit, so I'm not exactly sure what what the previous 89 presenters uh, have done. But but kind of my intent here is to more or less uh, share my enthusiasm about one particular uh, little narrow slice of numismatics that that I think uh, has a bearing on several larger uh, realms of numismatics. So we'll talk about uh, that kind of uh, interplay between uh, these merchant counter stamps and 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 other uh, larger fields. Um, and uh, I've got a, a bunch of pictures to run through. Um, most of the coins here are from my collection. Um, you know, any any dealer or professional numismatist worth their salt uh, is a collector as well. Um, and you know, we all we all have our, our little narrow areas that we try to hyper focus on. And and this has been one of mine now for uh, decades and decades, literally since I was a, a, a school kid. Um, as I run through these pictures, I'm sort of hoping that those pictures will inspire conversation. Um, you know, uh, I'll let you know what what uh, sort of you know they they make me think of, and and what uh, research opportunities or what kind of knowledge um, you know I can glean or you can glean from the coins presented. Um, if you have a question or a comment or something to add, I would encourage you to just jump in. Let's make this an actual conversation, um, and uh, and uh, and 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 we'll go from there. We're all we're all friends here, so uh, no reason to keep it too terribly formal. Um, so I, I guess with that, if you want to uh, hand me the the moderator baton so that I can share my screen, uh, and uh, we'll we'll make it happen here. So, all right. I hear my dog barking outside, so I'll, I'll apologize for that. He's Opie, and he's kind of the loudmouth of the family. 
Um, so we'll begin here, uh, since I know uh, so many of you are, are uh, uh, once or, or present New Yorkers, and maybe some of you are future New Yorkers as well. Of course, I was a uh, resident of Manhattan for, for several years, uh, beginning when I uh, joined the staff of Stacks after Stacks and American Numismatic Rarities um, uh, merged many years ago, and the numismatics of New York have always been uh, close to my heart. So I figured that was a, a pretty good place to start with this conversation about American merchant counter stamps. So uh, we called it today, uh, like stickers on a steamer trunk, uh, American merchant counter stamps on, on world coins, 1770 to 1870. And uh, the reason for those brackets, you could probably start earlier, you could certainly go later, uh, but that's a, a nice round figure that kind of estimates the, the real uh, prime era where we see these marks on, on various coins from around the world. Uh, one thing you won't see here today are any coins struck at the U.S. Mint. There's lots of them. They're very interesting. But the kind of knowledge that I try to capture from these coins um, is not the kind of knowledge that a seated quarter or a large cent can tell me. Uh, I'm looking for uh, information about what circulated in America, what kind of foreign coins the typical American of 1810 or 1830 or 1860 might encounter in their pocket change. Uh, and it's, it's, it's such a, a kind of foreign idea to a resident of the, of the 21st century, to a, a citizen of our modern world, this idea that you could go out shopping and, and look at your hand and see coins from 10 different countries and uh, have to figure out what they're worth and what's real and what's not, and the best places to spend each of these things. And one thing that these merchant counter stamps uh, do is, is it's sort of a, a little mark that says, I was here. Um, I visited this place. Uh, and with some documentary sort of historical research, we can often figure out that not only were you at a certain place, but this coin was at a certain place at a certain very narrow window of time. And what we'll see is that the coins that were marked in the inner Midwest were very, very distinctive from those marked in New Orleans or the Ohio Valley or New York or Boston. Uh, and it's, it's challenging to summarize what we know about the circulation of, of world coins. Uh, there's just so many different inputs of information, but I think this is a really important input and one that really graphically illustrates uh, in a sort of collar grabbing way uh, the phenomenon that we're talking about. So here we have two half pence. Um, which at some point in their lives were visitors to the Big Apple. So you've got on the left there, you've got a, a contemporary counterfeit George III halfpenny um, uh, of the uh, ostensibly 1770s era, although most of these counterfeits were, were made more in the 1790s. And on the right side, you've got a damn near slick George II English halfpenny um, that uh, that's, was marked very crisply and cleanly New York. Uh, the mark on the left is probably the mark of some kind of uh, fancy smith, um, like a silversmith, um, that would have been used on their um, uh, wares. Uh, and with some work, you could probably figure out exactly which smith was working with exactly that mark. And, and the, the other one, um, we can't identify it as to, to, to which merchant was using it, but just by typography and shape and size, it was probably more of a, a smith who worked in uh, harder metals, a blacksmith, um, a tool maker, somebody like that. And given the fonts, eh, 1810, 1820. So what can we learn from this? We can learn that a George II halfpenny was still in a New York City pocket in 1820 or thereabouts. And that at that time, it was really pretty worn, uh, which jives with the documentary evidence we have from places like the Common Council of New York Report of 1787, which describes heavily worn halfpence at that time, this sort of thing. So this is just another sort of evidence that helps us uh, focus on documentary evidence and published evidence as well. Um, uh, in Connecticut, uh, this very, very worn out George II halfpenny uh, was marked by a very well-known silversmith. Uh, uh, Mr. Emery used both of these marks, one with his uh, initials uh, and one with the, the longer name and that sort of uh, serpentine cartouche. And this coin was very worn when he marked it. Uh, and he was active in the, in the last quarter of the 18th century through the, the first decade or so of the 19th century. Um, one thing that we often encounter with these marks 
are marks that are just hard to identify, particularly when we're talking about uh, silversmith's touch marks, which are, you know, inevitably, uh, if they aren't actually someone's name, uh, they're often a, a series of initials that are common to many, many marks. So that means you really got to put on your researcher hat and dive into the silver references or dive into known attributed collections and be able to figure out that this 18th century style J, which is basically an I with a cross through it, was used in a narrow period of time and that this could have been, say, Samuel Johnson, who was working in Philadelphia uh, in the 1780s and 90s, which would have been a, a period and geographically appropriate uh, place for a 1745 Mexico City uh, to real to have circulated. Um, each and every one of these coins, and this is probably what attracts me to them the most, is not only a wealth of, of various information on, on various different axes of research, but everyone's a little mini research project. Who was this person? Who marked it? What else did they mark? Uh, that sort of thing. So, so it's, it's not straightforward. There are, there are so many things you can discover about these things. For instance, you could do the research and and try to figure out what the heck a Colombian garden was. Uh, you know, we've we've uh, all been on 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 Bowery. If we visited New York, probably maybe you were there visiting the absolutely offensive store that's now where CBGBs used to be that is selling you know high end merchandise to tourists, which breaks my heart having actually attended the punk shows at CBGBs back in the day. Uh, but anyway, there on the Bowery uh, was a place even in the 19th century for low-end bars for entertainment, for things like that. And Ebling's Columbian Garden was basically a beer hall, more or less. Um, and the neat thing about, about the marks from Ebling's Columbian Garden of 200 Bowery, New York, is that like many other large-scale counter stampers, they seem to have self-consciously used unusual coins. Um, there are lots of counter stamps that are known one at a time, two at a time, three at a time, that were more along the lines of, a bored blacksmith testing out his mark on a coin and sending it back into circulation, or a very, very uh, minor merchant uh, marking some things as an advertising thing. And then there are other merchants or other businesses like Ebling's that obviously made this a real focus of their advertising program uh, and marked hundreds of coins, if not thousands of coins, and sent them back into circulation with enough information that they could perhaps attract a potential uh, um, uh, customer to come to 200 Bowery to, to come have a beer. Um, <laughs> didn't expect punk shows. Hey, you know, the ANS has a diverse interest and the ANS membership has diverse interests. So why not talk about punk music a little bit? Um, uh, so Ebling's, it appears to get the coins for their counter stamps. Could they have been using just stuff that came through the till it's possible, but they use coins that are often so out of date and so old by the time they were marking their coins, late 1840s, early 1850s, that to my mind, it looks though like they went to one of New York's many brokerage houses, which is to say a, a place that specialized in old and out of date coins and actually bought random out of date coins at a discount and sent them back into circulation with their mark. For instance, the coin in the upper right there uh, uh, is Prussian, if memory serves. There's not a lot of German coins kicking around in New York by the 1850s. Certainly there's some. And we see more Ebling's marks on coins like that, geographically unusual coins, um, than you might see um, in the uh, uh, standard circulation, just sort of, you know, based upon our knowledge of what was circulating, the, the ratio of Ebling's coins on unusual hosts is, is higher than what it probably was just in pocket change. That pillar to real, which was already a hundred year old coin there at the bottom. Uh, again, that's the kind of thing that a, a coin broker uh, might well have bought at a discount, uh, more or less as bullion uh, for 18 cents or 19 cents or 20 cents, uh, allowing Eblings to not only use it as an advertising tool, but to make a little profit as they passed it back out of their till uh, at a, the value of full two reals. And then on the upper uh, upper right there, you've got a, a more typical, perhaps more age appropriate um, 1818. Uh, it's actually a Guatemala host um, uh, uh, on a two real also. Uh, one thing that in the decades that I've been doing this kind of surprised me from the start is how many Guatemalan coins circulated in the East Coast of the U.S. Guatemala was not a mint that put out a, a ton of coins like Mexico or Potosi or Lima. But a lot of them found their way here, um, uh, which, which has always struck me as, as sort of interesting. Let me pause at this point. Does anybody want to unmute themselves and ask anything?
don't let me just run roughshod over the conversation. All right, we'll continue. Uh, another one of the, the very large scale countermarks, uh, countermark factories, if you will, one of the merchants that, that really made this a focus of their advertising uh, was Dr. Gigi Wilkins, who Dave Bowers, of course, famously wrote a, a monograph on many years ago. And I think Gigi Wilkins is another one of these guys that was actively seeking out unusual types to put his mark on, perhaps with the idea that someone is more likely to look at a Canadian halfpenny token or a uh, British four pence or a French colonies Caribbean type five centimes, as you see there in the lower uh, left, uh, than they were just at a large cent. Now, uh, G.G. Wilkins, of course, marked large cents. He marked half dollars. He marked, you know, sort of standard stuff. But again, the, the uh, uh, proportion of Wilkins marks found on these fairly unusual types is greater than we see with, with other counter markers, which I think means uh, he, perhaps like Ebling's Garden, was actually going to merchants and banks and brokerage houses, buying unusual and out-of-date coins to mark and then, and then recirculate. Wilkins was uh, active in New Hampshire in a little tiny town and seeing the diversity of coins that ended up in the middle of New Hampshire, again, in the 1840s or 1850s is, is really nothing short of remarkable. Now, one place where you would expect to see a very unusual uh, and diverse uh, selection of coins is Gold Rush era San Francisco. Uh, and W.W. Light Dentist is perhaps the, the king or at least the crown prince of the San Francisco Gold Rush era marks, uh, seen here on a, on a, a silver piece from Württemberg uh, and a, a French 10 centime. Uh, W.W. Light uh, used his uh, uh, dental knowledge of chemistry and assaying to actually end up working with some of the pioneer minters out there. So he was a little closer to the coining and minting process than many of these counter stampers. Um, his marks are rare. Um, it is evident that his mark was uh, produced intentionally to use on coins for counter stamping. In other words, he wasn't putting this mark on people's dentures or on people's teeth or anything like that. Um, and you see uh, an, an astonishing array of undertypes or hosts on WW Light Dentist's um, uh, coins, uh, though in the scheme of counter stamps, the WW Light coins are actually very rare. Um, uh, he marked more gold than most counter stampers. Again, California Gold Rush, San Francisco in the 1850s sort of stands to reason. And fortunately, we have the world expert on California tokens on the call, and he's got his hand raised. So, Michael, go ahead. So, yeah, WW Light. Um, Ron, late Ron Lurch had a token that had WW Light um, uh, counter stamp on it, and um, it was sort of a generic token. I'd have to go find the photographs of it. But it seemed um, time inappropriate. Oh, and so okay. there was some question about whether or not um, it was genuine or not. And then, you know, at the time, some of the gold, gold, the gold ones were really rare. It was only the one that I think uh, that Don Kagan had on a slug um, yep. up until around that time. And, and, um, uh, a couple others. One, one appeared on an assay office ten, and um, the appearance of that token sort of led to questions about its authenticity. And I tried to, you know, look at the look at the counter stamps closely to see if they were identical, and I couldn't quite come to a conclusion. But my question is, you know, given that so that there was a counterfeiter outside out of Stockton, in there was, yes. Yeah. Um, you know, is there any question about the authenticity of, of the WW like counter stamps? I mean, have you ever heard well, of this kind of thing? Once, once one came up on the Central America, I think that that assured us all that there were counter stamp WW like coins circulating in the 1850s. You know, um, you can't fake that. No, one, no one's going to pitch a coin and, and land it exactly in the wreckage of the SS Central America. So, um, so that was helpful. Um, now, if the question is, are there such a thing as genuine WW like countermarks and fake WW like countermarks? Yeah, that's the question. You know, and this this did occur before the the Central America right. piece came to market. I, I mean, here's the thing: the the famous uh, counterstamp counterfeiter out of Stockton 
fortunately was an idiot and his work is not very good and it's not going to fool anybody you know the 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 marks are very distinctive they're the sans serif marks i mean the tools not made properly uh they picked poor host coins um you know i own several of them the shaw's flat and the lewis hoff and some of the other ones you know just as as research pieces and anybody of any sort of level of sophistication on these things is not going to be fooled by them um, it, did, it did fool people at the time, and there was a big lawsuit about it. <laughs> there was, yes, that's true. And, and uh, you know, fortunately, our knowledge has moved on from that a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Here's the thing. A countermarking tool, a stamp, is a durable tool. Um, and just like all sorts of other antique sort of things, oftentimes survive longer than the period we associate them with. Um is it possible that somebody in 1880 or 1890 or 1910 used the WW Light punch to stamp a token? Sure. Um, is it possible that WW Light himself used that mark past the 1850s into the 1870s or 80s? Sure. Uh, I don't know the token you're talking about, so I can't address it specifically. Um, but you know, if it's something that is still a 19th century token, um, I don't see any reason to think that he wouldn't have continued to mark things as long as he was active. Um, yeah, it was more like a, a, a 1900 kind of token. I'll, I'll yeah, find I mean, a picture and send it to you. Yeah, send me a picture and I can I can look at that. I mean, that doesn't sound right. Um, but, you know, again, uh, the... Yeah, I, I think your explanation of the fact that somebody found the counter stamp and did it, you know, after he passed away is probably the most logical especially because the, the California gold minters were conscious about their role in history and saved their stuff. You know, I mean, Humbert was a collector and his collection kind of passed intact. And, you know, several of the other characters out there, um, uh, you know, were, aside from being coin makers, were coin savers. So I don't see any particular reason that, you know, if Humbert's collection went into numis uh, numismatist hands and some of the dyes survived, that, say, W.W. Light's counter stamping tool might not have also. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that being said, I've seen enough of these things turn up in the wild. In other words, attributed onesies, twosies at coin shows for not a lot of money. I don't see any th reason to think that 98 plus percent of WW Light dentist countermarks are real appropriate end of the era. Thanks, John. Sure, of course. Thanks for the question. Um, probably the most famous of the gold rush um, uh, um, counter stampers is, of course, uh, J.L. Paul Hemus. Uh, who was uh, legendary for having his mark on a on a gold rush era twenty dollar gold piece? Um, this is back in the seventies and eighties. This thing was kicking around, and then a Paul Hemus mark turned up in Central America and sort of you know sent his marks into the stratosphere of interest. And, and they're interesting for a few reasons. Not only have they been found in interesting places on interesting big gold hosts, I will tell you that gold countermarks are very unusual and very rare as a breed. Um, but Paul Hemus has a neat looking countermark. I mean, the guy was a druggist. He's got a mortar and pestle on there. He's got, you know, the full address right in the heart of Sacramento. The mark was obviously tailor made for a coin counter stamping advertising um, uh, program. Uh, it fits very neatly into the um, top of the reverse of a, say, half dollar or a $20 gold piece. Um, and he very obviously. Uh, marked, if not all of the things that came through his till, the vast majority of them. Uh, there's a lot of Paul Hemus countermarks out there. Uh, we mostly see them on seated quarters, typically S-mints, of course, but you see them on all sorts of neat foreign types. I mean, here's a, a Bolivia a full real, um, which, you know, at some point probably came at the Pacific coast and made its way into the Bay Area, which I just find fascinating. Uh, here's the reverse of this coin. This is an 1830 uh, full real or four suelos. Um, uh, you know, an Austrian coin with a nice clear mark on it. Um, and, and perhaps my favorite, at least from my collection that I own of these things, how does an 1840 Indian rupee make it from India to San Francisco? I mean, a rupee is not something that we see anywhere else in America. Uh, it shouldn't surprise us that we encounter it in San Francisco, which had uh, so many uh, immigrants from Asia, from all over Asia, uh, showing up during the gold rush. Um, you see Paul Hemus marks on Russian hosts, on all sorts of things. But this one just fascinates me. It is literally the only Indian coin I know of uh, with an American countermark. Uh, and of course, it's the fact that it's a nice, big, handsome silver coin with a very clear mark makes this, you know, a highly desirable piece and a, a really interesting piece. Um, one of my other favorite countermark um, uh, producers um, uh, for the diversity of the hosts is Phillips Cheap Store in New Orleans. 
Now, New Orleans had a very different kind of um, coin economy, um, a very difficult, uh, very dif uh, distinctive circulating medium from any other city because it was essentially a Caribbean city. Um, you know, prior to the Civil War, uh, this was a place that saw just a ton of trade with the West Indies, a ton of trade um, with the Mexican cities along the Gulf. Uh, and of course, plenty of commercial intercourse with uh, Europe and Africa and, and everywhere else you can imagine. And uh, Philip's cheap store tended to only mark crown sized coins. And it's interesting, despite the fact that eight reals were very commonplace in New Orleans. Um, and we know this from every documentary source you can imagine. Um, despite the fact that things like Mexican revolutionary coins, which were not common most places in America, were common in New Orleans. And we know that from the, the Planters Bank countermarks, as well as, you know, lots of other stuff like the, the business dealings of the Lafitte's um, who were uh, active in, in Veracruz and in the Yucatan in that era. Um, despite all of that, the Phillips cheap store marks almost always occur on French five francs, um, which speaks to the uniquely French character of New Orleans. Uh, and, and this piece is a, is a, a, a Sardinian five lira of the same size, which uh, for Phillips cheap store, actually isn't that unusual a host. I've seen a few of these things, um, uh, despite the fact that anywhere else in America, a Sardinian coin with an American merchant countermark would be really unusual and really weird. Um, so, you know, you can see this is a coin dated 1850. Uh, this mark was used uh, primarily 1857, 58, 59, something like that. And we see it on French five francs dating uh, all the way back to the directory. So you've got, you know, 60 year old French five francs uh, getting marked uh, by Phillips cheap store. And here's the reverse of that, of that five lira. Um, in terms of other kinds of hosts, the classic host for American merchant countermarks that are on non-US coins is the two real. It's absolutely by, by far the most common coin we see countermarks. And I, I don't think that's accidental. Um, I think the, uh, the Spanish colonial two real um, was the most common small change coin in America, uh, more common than the one real, more common than just about anything struck by the US mint. Um, it's just two reals everywhere. Um, the uh, ranking of rarity that we see as collectors today was probably more or less the ranking of rarity that Americans encountered in their pocket change in the 1850s. Uh, Mexico City was the most common. Um, uh, Potosi and Lima were probably neck and neck, 2A and 2B, or, you know, 2 and 3. Uh, and then after that, uh, Guatemala, uh, you know, more than you might think. And from there on, it gets rare. Uh, you don't see a lot of Bogota, but you see them occasionally. You don't see a lot of Santiago, Chile, but you see them occasionally. And we'll go through here and we'll, we'll see a few other oddball things. Um, one thing that I've always found interesting is how frequently you see English hosts in Boston and Philly, but not so much in New York. New York uh, depended, I guess, uh, perhaps more on uh, trade with the West Indies. Um, and we're talking, just to focus us in time, uh, second quarter of the 19th century, so 1825 to 1850, up through the 1860s. Uh, and for some reason, you see a lot of English coins uh, getting countermarked in, in Philly and Boston. I'm not able to completely explain why that is and why it's less common in New York or Charleston or, you know, Norfolk or, or some other places along the eastern seaboard. Uh, and it's, it's also interesting to me because in the colonial era, when you would expect to see a lot of English coins, you see almost none. There were very, very few English coins. We know this from archaeology and documentary evidence and everything else. There were very, very few English coins circulating uh, in, in the 18th century in America. Lots of coppers, don't get me wrong. Um, lots of British half pence, but in terms of silver coins, like, like this half crown, very uh, few compared to, say, Spanish types. Uh, Stoltz's Cigar Store in Philadelphia, great type, cool merchant type, you know, neat, neat tobacconist uh, um, um, uh, uh, kind of interest there. Um, you always see it on English coins. I don't know if he was picking the English coins out of his till or if he was able to buy those at a discount or what the story is. You see it on half crowns. You see it on shillings. I've encountered it on two reals, but most of the time it's on English coins, which I just, I can't explain. I don't know. This is a 1842 shilling um, that has his mark. And from the shape and size of the mark, it looks like he produced it specifically for the shilling type host. Uh, another of the very large scale uh, counter markers is, is Stone and Ball of Syracuse. They used several different marks. 
Um, they obviously counter stamped over a long period of time and they counter stamped absolutely everything, uh, copper, silver, US, foreign, etc. And this is actually a Santiago host. This is one of the only Santiago uh, two reals that I've ever encountered with an American countermark. And as you can imagine, it's a long way from Santiago to Syracuse. Um, Stone and Ball was a, uh, a fancy goods merchant, sold silverware, things like that. Um, and they look like they're one of these ones, uh, one of these kinds of merchants that was specifically targeting uh, more out of date or more unusual hosts. Um, uh, you know, this, this Santiago piece is a fairly rare host just as a coin, forget as a, a host or an American countermark. But how rare would it have been to have seen a Condor token circulating in Syracuse in the mid 19th century? Um, you know, it's, it's easy for us to dismiss a lot of things that ah, Condor tokens, they didn't circulate in America. Well, the hell they didn't. Here's one. Uh, and it's not the only one. Uh, were they a big proportion of circulating change? Of course not. They, 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 that wasn't uh, what their intention was. But did some get here? We know from archaeological evidence that some got here. And we know from this counterstamp evidence uh, that some got here as well. And notice that this stone and ball mark, uh, which was actually intended for silverware, is a, a very different mark from, from this stone and ball mark, um, which, which uh, you know, again, puts the location on there as more of an advertising form. Um, in New England, um, specifically, we see a lot of Canadian hosts. That shouldn't surprise anybody who's ever been to upstate New York or New England. Um, you know, you're still getting Canadian pennies at par in Buffalo. Um, and, and at that time, uh, it was uh, no exception. Uh, Shattuck cigars, uh, this was meant as an advertising form. Smoke Shattuck cigars. This was not a mark that was put on cigar boxes. This is a mark that was made explicitly to mark on coins as an advertising form. Now, what's interesting to me is when you see Shattuck, and it's, it tends to be on Canadian coins, um, I'm no mathematician, but 1871 is after 1857. Um, 1857 is when ostensibly foreign coins left circulation by law, uh, when the act of 1857 demonetized them. But what we see from this counterstamp evidence is that that just wasn't the case. Um, and it wasn't the case more so in some areas than others. For instance, in the West, we see, um, and by West, I mean basically everything west of the Red River. I'm talking Texas. I'm talking the Southwest, obviously, uh, California into the uh, uh, upper Northwest. We see foreign types circulate far longer than they did on the East Coast. Um, in the um, rural um, inner Midwest, Iowa, Minnesota, the Dakotas, we see foreign types linger longer, perhaps because there was just less coins getting there. So when new immigrants were showing up in the 1870s or 1880s with Swedish coins and Norwegian coins and things like that, they were just spending them and they were being accepted locally. And in New England and upstate New York, we see Canadian coins getting marked as common circulating tender well after 1857. So while 1857 has always sort of been a pin in the historical numismatic timeline, this is when foreign coins left circulation. I, I just don't think that was actually the case historically. Um, with two reals, for instance, we see two reals getting marked uh, by people who are issuing Civil War tokens. And I don't see any reason to think that all of a sudden on February 23rd, 1857, everybody with a two real in their pocket dropped it down the sewer and walked away and got seated quarters in their pocket and said, these things were kicking around as long as as long as they could, and I think that that even worn out, you know, uh, Spanish American two reals were probably circulating in New York City, probably through the end of the 1860s. Um, you know, at which point you have enough American circulating medium made from the U.S. mints, uh, and these things were probably worn out enough that they were being sold uh, at a discount um, into these brokerage firms, who were then, you know, basically depositing them at the mint for recoinage. But it's interesting to me uh, how many of these Canadian types we see uh, along the Canadian border. Uh, for instance, this is a, 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 a silversmith um, uh, working in Buffalo in the 1870s. Again, this Canadian quarter would have just been taken in as a quarter um, in the 1870s in Buffalo. And if you've ever been around Buffalo or Niagara Falls, you know that you're seeing Canadian pennies and nickels and dimes in your change just the same way today. Maybe maybe less so today, um, but you know certainly when I used to go up there as a kid, um, you know early 80s stuff like that, you'd see those coins and wouldn't give it a second thought. Now, what's more interesting to me is when you see a Canadian half dollar marked with a mark that's probably made in New York City um, for something like a minstrel troupe. Um, 
New York City, for those of you who are geographically challenged, is not particularly near Canada. Uh, and this mark is typically seen on seated half dollars. Um, so what does that tell us? This was just a coin that was just happened to be in circulation in New York when this was getting marked. And that's mid to late 1870s. So even in New York City, you're still seeing Canadian coinage well after the act of 1857. Uh, all right, Bill, chime in here. I want to hear you describe this coin. Unmute yourself. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, sure can. Go okay, ahead. Okay, great. Uh, so I've never seen an image of this, but it is described by Rulau, and it's a, a two real that was apparently still in circulation in Marietta, Pennsylvania on April 28th, 1869. So we have the exact date and the name of the woman who got it. So I think that's, I love it. that's fascinating. And, and if, if that coin ever turns up at auction, you and I are going to have to like arm wrestle for it or something, aren't we? I call dibs. Okay. <laughs> you got it. You live there. You got it. So yeah, Marietta, Pennsylvania, it, that's Lebanon County, right, Bill? Lancaster. Lancaster County. Okay. So you got Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. So you've got a, an inland city in Pennsylvania, 50-ish miles west of Philadelphia or whatever it is, um, still seeing um, Guatemala portrait two reals in circulation, you know, four years after the end of the Civil War. So that's fascinating. Cool. Thank you for bringing that up, Bill. That's very, very cool. Yep. Um, all right. So I'm going to just kind of run through some other random coins we can talk about in terms of the different types of merchants who are marking things. Uh, you'll see a lot of two reals here. Um, H.M. Whitbeck Circus. You can imagine what Whitbeck Circus was. It was a circus. Now put on your thinking caps and tell me, how much did it cost to get into Whitbeck Circus? Admission was 25 cents. So you see with a lot of these sort of entertainment venues, they're on two reals because that was the cost to get into one of these things. So a lot of circus collectors out there. Uh, and that's a, a very, very cool mark. Um, Winder or Winder at the corner of West Row and Court in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, Cincinnati is not a real common source for uh, countermark. So this is a, a kind of a cool thing. And I'm actually... I'm cheating here. I'm looking up in my Brunk book to see if I can rem remind myself what, what kind of merchant Winder or Winder was. And uh, we will see if he's listed in here. Uh, doo, doo, doo. And there's actually no listing in the main text of Brunk, which means this is actually kind of a rare thing. Um, the glory of a name this distinctive, particularly one with such a precise geographical marker, is it would take me all of about five minutes to go into newspapers or directories or anything else and figure out exactly who this person was when they were operating, all of that sort of stuff. Which frankly, I've probably done and just forgotten about because I've had this coin for a long time. Um, another favorite merchant, we're back to the, the entertainment uh, uh, strip along the, the Bowery in New York, uh, which you know I, I, it's hard to look at coins like this and, and not think of Gangs of New York and you know that era in the city and, and you know the kinds of uh, foul language and bad liquor that was getting poured out at a place like Sockham's Oyster Saloon. Um, but uh, just an absolutely classic New York merchant type, one of these you know restaurant entertainment kind of halls. Um, anytime you get a distinctive host coin, it's fun. When you get a distinctive host coin and a distinctive name, it's even more fun. This is a, a uh, Guatemala um, uh, uh, 1791 two real with a distinctive uh, uh, short-lived two or three year type on the portrait. And uh, this looks like a silversmith mark, this sort of conforming cartouche. And fortunately it's a distinctive spelling of Pierce. So this, this would be uh, relatively easy to identify. Um, when you see the name Harvey Wettstein, you're probably thinking, okay, that sounds like it might be Jewish. This is probably a New York merchant. No, he was in Harvard, Illinois, uh, and was a Midwestern merchant working in, you can see the date of this coin is 1877. Wettstein counterstamped an awful lot of coins, and he was there in the 1870s and 80s. So even in central Illinois, in the late 1870s and 1880s, you still got Mexican uh, aid reals uh, circulating through Wettstein's uh, stop. And he must have been a, 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 a very impressive merchant with the amount of coins he marked and the little town he was, uh, that he was in, he must have been doing an awful lot of business. Uh, another one of, of my favorite kind of merchant types, a coachmaker. And there's two coachmaker marks. And oddly enough, they're both from Little Hanover, Pennsylvania. Grumbean is, is the other sort of famous one. Welsh uh, is the more rare one. Uh, and this is on a, a Mexico one real. 
um, uh, one of the best known American countermark um, uh, countermarkers or counterstampers was Halx Panacea, which was a um, uh, a uh, quack medicine. It was, it was basically, you know, liquor more or less. It was a, a rum drink, and Halx Panacea uh, was one of these patent medicines that came out of Baltimore. Uh, and this mark was produced to put on a half a dollar. That's how much I guess a bottle cost, and it fits just precisely in the obverse field of a bust half. 85% or 90% of Halx marks that you see are on bust halves, but you occasionally see them on other types. I've got one on a two real, uh, and this is, you know, one of my prized Halx panaceas, um, which again is on a very early uh, French Ecu. This is mid 1790s. So this thing found its way into Baltimore uh, in the 1840s or 1850s. EM and JE mix of Ithaca. That's a mark on a two real. I don't remember what the mixes did either. Um, this is a very distinctive and very popular type, 444 Broadway, uh, the Christie and Woods Minstrel Troupe, um, which uh, is unusually graphic. It actually depicts, uh, you know, two dancing figures there uh, on the obverse. This is a Potosi to Real of 1774. Griffin of Hudson, New York was a silversmith in a little tiny town. At least it was tiny then. This is a Boston mark, good for a bottle of Pierce's Rosetta hair tonic on a, a fairly high grade two real. Here's another New York mark on Hudson Street, a saw filer. And this mark was probably less intentionally done for advertising. This was probably the mark that he put on his saws, if I had to guess. Um, and, uh, you know, when you see marks that are for jewelers or saw filers or tool makers or gunsmiths, they tend to be the mark that actually matches up um, with their wares. Uh, another popular uh, minstrel mark, uh, again, at 444 Broadway, um, same as the uh, Christian Woods Minstrels, the predecessor, uh, the Admit to Woods Minstrels. And this is a very, very common counter mark, but also very popular, uh, mostly seen on two reals. It's 25 cents to get into the, to their uh, show as well, although you do occasionally see it on, on larger coins like four reals. Another nail in the coffin of Condors never circulated in America. Um, you have uh, Mr. Helock here uh, in Massachusetts, L.W. Helock on an Irish type Condor. So I like interesting hosts and I also like oddball locations like this very worn out two real that made its way to Mayville, Wisconsin. This is a 1773 two real. The reverse is totally slick, so you can't even see it. Um, by the time a 1773 two real would get this slick, this was probably a mark that was right around the Civil War. Another favorite mark, uh, Jones Exchange Hotel at 77 Dock Street in Philly. Um, several different marks were used. Uh, it's usually seen on one reals and two reals. You do see it on uh, U.S. types as well. Uh, but this has to be the absolute coolest host. This is a counterfeit eight real, uh, brass counterfeit uh, Mexican eight real. Uh, which tells us a few things. First, there were counterfeit eight reals kicking around Philly in the 1850s, but perhaps more importantly for our purposes, it tells us that in the whole world of Mexican counterfeit eight reals, this particular dye variety was circulating in America. Now, is it possible that this dye variety just happened to be one that showed up uh, in Philly's uh, port? It's possible. Is it more possible that there was a bag of 500 of these things sold to somebody to circulate in North America somewhere? probably more likely. So, so this is a, a type that um, I would need to cross-reference it to Riddell's work in, in New Orleans in the 1840s, but, but it's, it seems likely that this particular counterfeit variety might have been one uh, that was more frequently seen or perhaps even intentionally uh, made or, or exported to uh, uh, America, uh, to the United States. And of course, there's also the possibility that it was actually made in the U.S., but you would need a lot more evidence to, to prove that. Another favorite oddball location here is a 1794 Lima to Real uh, marked um, with a silversmith's mark. You can see it right here in Natchez, Mississippi. So a, a town of great wealth uh, in the early 19th century. Um, and, uh, and this one, like stickers on a steamer trunk, um, got marked by a whole bunch of silversmiths in that town, which, which tells me that maybe this wasn't actually marked by those silversmiths, but was maybe marked by the tool maker in town who was making the silversmith's tools. Great piece.
And I think this is the only one known on, on this Hayden Goodrich, et cetera, et cetera, of matches. It looks like, John, it looks like that coin itself is double struck, if I'm not mistaken. If you look at the Carolus, is that double struck? Oh, yeah, it sure is. Yeah. Yep. That's exactly right. It sure is. Yeah, you can see a, a good bit of doubling here and, and less so elsewhere in the legend, but yeah, significant doubling down here. Yeah, that's good, right? That's exactly right. Good eye. Here's another Jane's uh, Jones Exchange Hotel. Uh, this is made with a different mark than the mark seen on that counterfeit Mexican 8, uh, and this is on a very, very worn out uh, Prussian type, um, which again, is an unusual host, but you know, Philadelphia saw all sorts of things coming through, including unusual European types. Uh, this is on a very worn pillar to real. Uh, and this is another great classic San Francisco type. Uh, and Michael, do I see you also have a JT Jones countermark there behind you? Indeed, I do. Um, <laughs> there were um, uh, four or five of them that came on the market from uh, uh, the late Ron Lurch. And um, you're probably aware of the article in Talking Tokens that uh, discusses a possibility of why this, um, uh, how this piece was used. And of course, it's connection to uh, the, 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 well, the Blue Wing Saloon and um, connection to James King and William. Summarize that for us. Give me the, give me the short version of that Talking Tokens article. <clears throat> well, the, the author, um, I think his name is Bill Groom, speculates that, um, well, he has evidence that they, that they had a raffle at, um, Jones and his partner had a raffle. And um, in Kagan's book, there's this mark on a $50 slug. Yep. And, um, and the, the speculation is, is that that would have been one of the bigger prizes and the lesser prizes would have been the silver pieces um, of which there probably are 10 known. Yeah, it's a rare um, mark. This is definitely a rare mark. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Ron had four of them. Yeah. Um, one of them was also on a, um, a Spanish colonial coin. Um, my friend Frederico Castillo ended up with that one. Um, gotcha. They were pretty hotly contested in yeah. uh, an auction by Dwayne Faisal. And yeah. the Blue Wing Saloon was interesting because um, there was an argument between uh, Cora and Richardson. Richardson was um, a prominent guy. And Cora was married to um, a, uh, a madam named Bell, uh, Bell Cora. Okay. And, um, and uh, uh, Richardson's wife insulted Bell Cora. And so Cora had this argument with Richardson at the Blue Wing Saloon and then um, shot him a few, um, few days later. And uh, he was one of the, um, the, uh, um, the two people that were lynched um, by uh, the Vigilance Committee, um, the other one being the guy who shot uh, James King and William. Yeah, yeah. So this this one has probably a better story than a lot of these things do. So, but it's but a, the, but the, the raffle was before the, the the assassinations. Yeah, yeah. So and this 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 mark was made uh, obviously to use on coins. There's there's no other real reason for this mark to exist than as a as a advertising tool on coins. So what what do you think about the idea that these were prizes for a raffle? I would have to look at the documentary evidence. I mean it's it's certainly possible and we would have to see what the evidence would say. So beyond anything without evidence is speculation, but if there's evidence, eh, maybe there's evidence. So you know I, I'd be it, happy it, to look it at it seems that. plausible um to me, but not definitive. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's certainly possible, especially considering the rarity of these things. I mean, there would have been so many coins going through the Jones saloon or the, you know, the business in general, um, that, you know, if they were really trying to do a self-conscious advertising effort, um, you would think they would have marked a lot more coins. You just don't see these, you know, this is a, a genuinely rare thing. It's cool. I like it. <laughs> it is. It is. So, uh, this is not a great picture. I apologize for that, but, um, uh, this is uh, a jeweler from Elkhart, Indiana, uh, which is kind of an unusual place to see a Canadian bank token. Um, and uh, uh, these Canadian um, uh, coppers uh, clearly circulated not just in Canada, not just in border areas like the Niagara Frontier and Upper New England, um, but saw uh, circulation well beyond there into other parts of the United States as well. Um, so we, we see this kind of hosts on, on, uh, uh, with marks from all over the country. Um, it is unusual to see a relatively high-grade coin 
um, far removed from the time of its marking. Um, this is one of them. Usually when you're going to see a George II half penny, especially a, a, a earlier young head type, it's going to be pretty worn out by the time it hits a, uh, a merchant's till in the 1840s or 50s. Um, Godwin's grease, go, uh, goose grease uh, was a, a, a hair ointment, more or less. Um, a very common countermark. You see it a lot on bust dimes and bust half dimes and seated quarters. Um, but, but this thing is not all worn out and it would have been, you know, something like a hundred years old by the time it got, um, uh, by the time it got circular or by the time it got countermarked. So this, this is sort of a, a pretty unusual coin. It's also unusual insofar as used GG and G is not usually seen on, on foreign hosts of any kind. I think this is the only one I own. Um, this is a, a particularly beautiful piece. And this is not a mark that would have been made just for uh, coin counter stamping. This would have been uh, placed on the back of a, uh, a metal frame for a photograph amber type by Moses Hale. He was a, a Boston area photographer. And this is an 1842 uh, English half crown. Um, again, if we like small towns better than big towns in the world of counter stamps, it's tough to get a smaller town than Tawanda, Pennsylvania. Um, it's still a small town. It wasn't much of a town either uh, back when Geiger was there. And again, this is, this is probably a mid 19th century uh, type. Uh, this is one of my, my very favorites. Um, uh, Ferguson was a gunsmith and toolmaker in Huntsville, Alabama. And this is uh, about the only Alabama countermark that you're likely to see. Uh, the fact that it's on a eight real is impressive. Larger coins are much more unusual than, than uh, uh, subsidiary denominations. Uh, and the fact that it's on a, a Peruvian type, a Lima type, uh, makes it much more interesting. So this would have been the mark that he would have applied um, to a tool, or uh, probably more so than a gun, um, but instead he decided to line up his marks and put it on the middle of this eight real. So this was this was one of the highlights of the Partridge collection, and it's now in a in a Fort Mill, South Carolina cabinet. Um, Moses Farman. Thank God for unusual names. Uh, it did not take me long to figure out where old Moses was from here. Uh, let me pull his flip out here, and I'll I'll remind myself. Uh, Moses was from. Oshkosh, Wisconsin, where he was a uh, tool maker uh, right around 1850. And you can see a mark like this appearing on a, a plane or a drill or, or something like that made in 1850 uh, in, in, uh, Osh, uh, um, in uh, Oshkosh. Winston, yes, that's right. Artist was a, was a term for photographers uh, in that era in the 1840s or 50s. Um, another uh, geographically unusual mark and a place that you might not expect to encounter a two real. Um, uh, this is not Denver, North Carolina, and this is not Denver, Pennsylvania. Uh, Mr. Dibble was one of the Colorado pioneers. He was listed there in the 1860 census. He moved out there in the 1850s. Uh, and this is absolutely the only uh, Colorado merchant countermark I've ever seen on a, a Spanish colonial coin. So you've got a 1777 uh, Mexico portrait to real that made its way to Denver during the Colorado gold rush. So this is that's kind of a special thing. Dr. Darby marked a lot of coins of all sorts of types. Uh, this is the only Irish bank token that I've ever seen, but of course it's not that unexpected, I guess, to see an Irish coin kicking around Boston in the mid 19th century. Uh, more typically though, you see a lot of Dr. Darby's marks on, um, uh, on Mexican cap and raise types. Uh, this is a, uh, a two real. Um, Dubuque, Iowa. Dubuque, 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 Iowa. Um, Cannon was a grocer. Um, this is, I think, a unique mark. This came out of Partrick as well. Uh, I believe it's the only mark of his known. Another Canadian uh, bank token marked by a toolmaker from Springfield, Mass. Springfield being a town full of toolmakers and gunsmiths and things like that. How does a Spanish mainland copper make its way to Nashua, New Hampshire? This is uh, about the only uh, 19th century eight Maravedis I've ever seen with an American mark, J.B. Menso of Nashua, New, ha New Hampshire, which is upside down there on that type. Kunkel's Opera Troupe was just what it sounded like. It was a musical performance troupe. Uh, they were based in uh, Baltimore. Very common mark. You see a ton of these on two reals. You see a ton of these, uh, particularly on pillar two reals. Uh, so again, they were probably going to a, a coin broker and buying out of date coins for, for cheap to recirculate them. Uh, but this is the only one I've ever seen on a, on a German coin, but there was enough uh, commerce coming in and out of Baltimore that pretty much nothing would surprise me uh, in terms of coins uh, located in Baltimore. Now let's talk a little bit about, about coins like this. 
this is not a merchant countermark. Um, this is a, a personal coin uh, that was marked with a uh, set of punches. So in other words, not a um, an intended punch, but a, a set of you know alphabetical A through Z punches all lined up one at a time. Now, could a coin like this be faked? Yes, and it happens. Is there a way to tell that a coin like this was stamped in 1850 in McCoy's Bluff, South Carolina versus last week to sell on eBay to some you know fish like me? 30 years of experience, uh, I guess, is the, the best way to figure out. Um, you know, you'll, you'll see um, uh, coins take on a different tone. Obviously, you'll um, see typography that is uh, commonplace in the 19th century um, that maybe um, would, uh, would uh, be less uh, able to uh, uh, be manufactured lately. That was one of the things that condemned the Stockton counterfeiter as he used a sans serif font that just was completely out of place in the 19th century. Um, and I'll tell you on this coin, I'm a South Carolina guy. I've lived here a long time. I've got good resources for identifying historical characters in South Carolina. It took me days to figure out where McCoy's Bluff was. It's not even a town. It's a crossroads. I had to find a map from 1850 that had this little tiny crossroads in the low country identified as McCoy's Bluff. It was never a town. It was never a post office. If I'm going to fake a coin, you know, most of the ones you see are pretty obvious, you know. A lot of them have Confederate kind of things going on with them, you know, that's made for some, you know, captain of the Louisiana Guards or something. They're obvious. They jump out of you. But something like this with a very unusual host and a very unusual location and a, a person that I was able to identify, um, uh, I think these are pretty special. And I think it's pretty interesting that a coin from Mecklenburg Schwerin would be kicking around the low country of South Carolina in the 1860s also. So. Um, while not a merchant countermark, I will collect these as well and, and try to learn as much as I can from them. Um, one problem that you sometimes run into are businesses with common names. There was a city hotel in just about every town in America in the 1850s. Everybody had a city hotel. Which city hotel made this one and put it on a Spanish mainland type full real, which is a very unusual host for America? I have no idea. I don't know. I couldn't tell you. I could guess. I think Brunk attributes it to Louisville. That's possible. Um, you know, uh, the city hotels that tended to be along along rivers tended to be very, very popular. I don't know. Um, but still, I think it's cool that a Spanish mainland for Real was kicking around America. Obviously, this is not the city hotel of Madrid or the, you know, city hotel of some other place. This is obviously an American mark. And then you get into stuff like this. I am never, no matter how much research I do, going to figure out who M. McCarty is. Just too common a name. There's not enough there. Maybe someday I'll get lucky, but unlikely. However, the fact that a Chihuahua copper is marked with a very obviously American merchant countermark is fascinating. This is not the kind of thing I would ever expect to be circulating in America. You know, it was bigger than a half cent. It was larger than a than a, or smaller than a large cent, bigger than a half cent. Um, you know, it's a it's a crude thing. These were made for very very local circulation in Mexico. Um, how did this get to wherever Michael Matthew Moses McCarty lived? I have no idea, but that's fascinating. And someday maybe I'll I'll be able to identify it. Uh, Bill, go ahead. I think I saw your hand first. Yeah, this one's actually really interesting um, because there is a, a Canadian blacksmith token, or it's yes. attributed to that series, that I would have to check. That might even be the same die. But there's a Chihuahua copper with a Bukesu reverse. Yes, yes. So Which was made in Belleville, I assume? Uh, the reverse die was. Okay. <laughs> but I can't figure out what the Chihuahua relationship is. So this is the only other one that would indicate any sort of American or Canadian circulation for it. Yeah. So we know at least one, and this is just a regular Chihuahua piece. I mean, this isn't, yeah. you know, some kind of funky muling or anything, but, um, but yeah, this, it, when I encounter this thing, it's like, that's really weird. I have to buy that, even though I'll never be able to figure out anything else about it. So Michael, go ahead. Uh, John, this, this coin looks like it was found by a metal detectorist. Um, I don't know if it is was or not, but that's also information if the location of where it was, oh, for dug, sure. where it was found yeah. might help narrow things down. 
believe it or not, the even the non dug examples of these look this ugly. So <laughs> this this may have come out of the ground. I think it probably likely did. Uh, but on these, they tend to have that real striated kind of appearance also. I see. I see. Yep. Now, one kind of copper coin that you wouldn't think was relatively common in early America, but was a lot commoner than I would have thought before I started doing this stuff. Russian two kopecks, um, basically the same size and weight as a large cent. Um, I, to Michael's point, I have records of these things being found by metal detectorists in New England. I own one that's actually cut in half for small change to make a half cent out of that was dug up in Rhode Island. Uh, and I own several of them with American countermarks on it. Now, cast steel was a very common mark. I'll never be able to associate this with a particular person or, or uh, geographic area, but it's very obviously an American mark and thus, you know, very obviously uh, a Russian two kopeck that was kicking around America. So um, uh, another favorite mark, uh, these good for 25 cent S Meyer or S Myers. Um, I assume S Myers was a broker or some kind of banker. And he took two real sized silver coins that were basically worn slick, uh, like this four groschen, which is a very unusual type, and told everybody what it was worth. Good for 25 cents. So you could spend this as a, as a quarter or as a two real, despite the fact that it's a very slick, very worn four groschen. Uh, another geographically unusual one. Again, this is probably a, phot a photographer, a daguerreotypist, uh, A.B. Walker artist of Iowa City, Iowa. How about a Spanish Netherlands coin that kicked around in Rochester in the 1860s? This is a relatively uh, later mark. This might actually have been from the 1870s. And this is a coin that's about the size of a half cent. Why this was in Rochester? You got me. Why was a Guadalajara 8 real of the Mexican Revolutionary Era in Philadelphia? Jay Winter was a, a silversmith. And I actually bought this from a dealer from Spain. So these things circulated around the world back then. And now in the numismatic market, they circulated around the world yet again. Indonesia, Sumatra, Vermont. Makes perfect sense. This is Dutch East Indies marked by a, um, a tool maker in Woodstock, Vermont. I don't know how it got there, but I love the fact that it did. Here's another two copec of a later type, Mark C. Rawlings. I'll probably never figure out who C. Rawlings was, but wherever he was, there were some Russian coins kicking around there. Uh, Cincinnati is interesting. Cincinnati is a river town. Uh, of course, it's on the Ohio River. And the marks that you see in uh, uh, marked from Louisiana, or, or I'm sorry, from Louisville or Cincinnati have more in common with Louisiana than they do with the East Coast cities. Um, the river economy that came through New Orleans and went up to Mississippi and then went up the Ohio brought in a lot of coins like this to places like Louisville and Cincinnati. And that goes for archeological recovered coins, cut coins, metal detector coins, or in this case, a silversmith marked coin, uh, this being a, uh, a um, uh, five franc uh, from France that was marked in Cincinnati. Another cool five franc marked by a gunsmith from Springfield, Mass, R. Payne. This is an earlier type, 1780s type. R. Martin was a silversmith in Hudson, another five franc, and he happened to put a date on his as well. Um, most of his marks do not have this date on there, but for some reason he decided to date this one. Speaking of New Orleans and getting interesting oddball type, this is another sort of handmade personal piece. And this was a guy that I was able to identify. He was a, a merchant of some means. So I guess had this as a pocket piece or somebody gave it to him as a gift. Uh, and that's a Dutch two and a half golden of 1846. And since we're running low on time, I'm going to wrap it up with, with probably one of my favorite pieces in my collection. Um, Mr. Bloodgood here, his name was, I think, Lenard Bloodgood. Um, was a silversmith around Albany, 1820s. And somehow this coin got from Pasto in Ecuador, then Colombia, modern day Ecuador. It's a rare coin. It's a rare mint. It's an unusual piece. This thing got from the interior of Ecuador to upstate New York to be marked by a silversmith around Albany in the 1820s, which I think is just absolutely fascinating. There you can see the, the reverse Cool mark, conforming cartouche, seen on his silverware, and seen on this really oddball Ecuadorian portrait to real of 1822. So uh, I could go on and on for, for ages, but we've been at it for an hour. So I'm sure everybody has to go back to work or back to their life. 
Um, but I will be happy to entertain some questions if folks have them. I see one popped up here in the chat. Um, yes, so European coins absolutely came with immigrants. One thing I didn't touch on was the preponderance of Scandinavian coins that come with marks from places like Wisconsin and Minnesota. You can understand why that would be as these people came over. Um, they brought coins with them and they continued to have uh, financial dealings with the old country. So, um, you know, you, you see those coins come over. Why are so many of these examples hold? That's a really good question. And I don't have a good answer for it. I think some of it is the phenomenon we discussed about um, large scale countermarkers <laughs> getting coins um, from brokers for a discount. Uh, and the hold coins would have probably been um, a discounted coin that they could kind of pass into circulation and make some money on with their mark on it. Uh, and I think for, for some of these things that are more one-offs where you have something like a blacksmith testing his mark or whatever, they're just trying something that's, you know, cheap and worthless or, you know, lower value. And, uh, and you know, the hold ones would be. All right, uh, Dr. Schwimmer, after nearly all money left circulation in 1861, did foreign money show up more since something is better than nothing? Um, interesting question and not one I really know the answer to. Um, uh, my best guess is that um, when coins left circulation during the Civil War, they hoarded everything. Um, I think um, there were probably uh, just as U.S. coins left circulation, I think the other stuff that seemed to be of good silver content probably left circulation right along with it. Uh, and I don't think the proportions uh, necessarily changed during the Civil War. Uh, I will mention, though, that in terms of foreign coins getting dug up uh, by metal detectorists or in archaeological digs at known Civil War sites, campgrounds, battles, or whatever, there's still plenty of, of foreign coins that are getting turned up at, at known Civil War sites. Uh, Dave Fanning um, points out that there's a, a the Chihuahua piece had a good article in the RCNA journal. The purpose of the non-merchant countermarks. Good question. Um, some of them were luggage tags. Um, so let me pull this one up. This is this is probably a luggage tag. Um, this is on a uh, a Gothic florin. Mr. Dresser of Boxford, Mass. wanted a classy thing to put in his bag, and what better than a nice English coin? Uh, a lot of the things that you see identified as Civil War dog tags uh, are actually luggage tags, uh, and were were you know made or marketed as such. Uh, some I think were gifts. Some I think were more or less jewelry items. Um, you know, some were to commemorate the birth or death of a child. We see that fairly regularly. And then a lot of it was sort of, you know, just inscribed, hey, you, you won the horse race, you won the bet, I'm giving you this coin and putting your name on it and a date. Uh, and sometimes with some research, we can find stuff like that. For instance, I've got a countermarch coin that was actually the result of a bet between uh, two bar owners in Seattle. And I was able to find newspaper coverage of their bet, and I've got the coin that was the result of it. So, you know, all of these things are uh, individual little fun research projects. So um, thanks to those in the chat that uh, enjoyed the presentation. Uh, as you can tell, this is a, a series that kind of uh, hits a lot of buttons for me. I like foreign coins that circulate in America. I like research projects. And, uh, and this kind of uh, wraps a ribbon around several of those uh, uh, kind of areas. So it's a, it's a neat, neat form of information for us. And I have a question. Go ahead, please. Uh, are you aware of any uh, pieces struck by the Benedict Brothers in New York City? They were a jewelry store in the 18, early 1800s. I'm not. I'm not. I have not, not heard of any countermarks from that particular merchant. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, I have a quick comment about it. The it said good for 25 cents by S. Myers on a really, yeah. really worn down coin. I know that by yes. the early 1840s, 1844, 1845, certain places uh, were accepting Spanish coins, very worn Spanish coins at a discount for, you know, instead yep. of 25 cents, uh, they were taking them at 20 cents, even stuff like the U.S. Post Office and whatnot. Yes. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Mr. Myers got that coin at a discount and was using it as an advertisement saying, hey, I'll still take this as 25 cents while everyone else is only taking it for 20 cents. So I, I think probably, that's probably exactly right. Yeah, because yeah. it's always on super worn coins. Always, always, always. Yeah. Uh, and, and sort of connected to that, there are counter stamps that I sometimes encounter um, where you'll see uh, like worn out pistarines that are marked like 17 and a half. Seven one seven with a with a half mark. Hmm. 
which I think are probably related somehow to that discounting of well-worn uh, foreign types that was occurring, as you said, in the 1840s and 50s. And then, you know, that sort of ratcheted up as time went on, as uh, the coins got even more and more worn. So yeah, you could write a whole dissertation just about that process of discounting coins, because there's a ton of great documentary evidence on it. I have a, I have a, a chapter of a dissertation on that, so. <laughs> Good, I can't <laughs> wait to read it. Dissertation, just the chapter of it, but. That is totally uh, up my alley. And for those people who are interested more on this, you know, the, this is the Bible. This is the Brunk book. It's gone through a couple of editions. This is the most recent edition. Um, and, you know, lots of illustrations, lots of identification of marks. But the real fun part is finding something he doesn't identify. And there are endless resources to identify these marks, too. So that's that's where the fun comes in. Excellent. Uh, looks like we uh, answered all the questions in the chat and no one else has their hand raised. Uh, a lot of thanks, a lot of praise as, uh, as, as rightfully so. Uh, John, I want to thank you so much for, for giving us our, our 90th uh, long table talk today. Um, and thank you so much. And thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication and events, you can support the society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.